So we're beginning this very familiar section. If you haven't, if you've read Revelation, it's really likely you've read chapters two and three, because this is kind of the more straightforward part of Revelation. It's letter. It's what are usually called letters to the churches. Uh, letters to the churches. I call them messages. These are the Lord's messages to the seven churches. Um, we're not going to take a Sunday for each of the seven messages to the churches. We're just going to take it slow today just to get our bearings on understanding the nature of these messages, the pattern of these messages. And then as we get our bearings, we'll kind of quicken our pace a little bit as we move through the rest of the six messages. But a few things about these messages before we get into it. All right. And I think I have, what do I have? I have four, four things about these messages, just the nature of these messages. Okay. Number one, these are messages, not letters. These are not letters. The whole book of Revelation is one letter. It is one letter. And within the letter are specific messages that the Lord has for particular churches by location. And the first location is Ephesus, then Smyrna, Pergamum, and so forth. All of these locations on what is today known as Turkey, right? The country of Turkey, right along the coast of Turkey. So these are messages and not letters. That means that these letters, the letter of Revelation was distributed and circulated among all these churches. And if you were one of these churches, your eyes would be like, whoa. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to us. It's, it was like it would be, here's a message to the church in San Francisco. Of all the cities in the world, of all the places, he's picking us. What does he have to say to us? And so that's, that's the whole point. These are particular messages to particular churches in cities. But since they're all getting all of these letters, if you're reading the one to Ephesus, but you're living in Pergamum, you're like, I know what he said to us in Pergamum. What do you say to Ephesus? And what do you say to Smyrna? And what do you say to Sardis? You know, you want to know what is he saying to all the churches and how bad is it for us, you know, in terms of what he has to say to us, all the stuff we need to work on and all of that. So that's the point. The point is, this is one letter with seven messages, seven messages that are for all the church. So when we read through each of these messages, you're going to see relevance to where we are here in San Francisco. But you're also going to see that there's probably one of these messages that's really particular to you, to us, something that really hits home to us. All right. So these are messages to us. Number two, these messages are delivered by angels. Do you notice that? Even Linda, when she was reading, she kind of caught herself. It wasn't to the church in Ephesus. It was to the angel of the church in Ephesus. What's the whole point of this? It means that each church in its locality has an angel that's representing them and is responsible for that church. What? Do you ever think about that? That New Life Church can have an angel? And I don't think it's just our church. I think the angel, and we'll see this uh, in a minute, that the angel is an angel that oversees all the churches in San Francisco. So the whole body of Christ in San Francisco is being represented by an angel. And this angel is delivering messages from heaven to us. Like right now. You know what I'm saying? Right? What, what is happening here is a message from heaven to you. Now, how does, how does an angel do that? An angel can do that in a lot of different ways. It, it can, an angel is going to work through anyone who teaches God's word. So an angel is going to speak to me about what's important, what's, God, what's on God's heart for our church. An angel might direct me to a certain article. It might direct me to a person who has a conversation with me. The angel can do a lot of things to get me to understand the message that God wants me to give to you from heaven. Okay? So this isn't a TED talk, right? This isn't just a little lecture, right? Heaven's involved. Heaven's involved. And let me give you a little bit of a window of how this angel 
got this message to us. If you turn to the Old Testament and look at the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10, there's an angel that comes to Daniel when Daniel gets a vision of Jesus. And if you look at verse 10, this is, this is a great read. So hope you're, hope you're with me. Daniel chapter 10, verse 10. Just listen to this. Here's Daniel. He's before Jesus and he is just like he's dead. He's in the glorious presence of Jesus and he is undone. And then it says this, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up for I have now been sent to you. Now this is an angel speaking to Daniel, has a message and he's gonna deliver it. So he's saying, Daniel, wake up, be with me, okay? And then he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But now he's gonna go on and talk about how he hit traffic. He hit a bunch of traffic on the way. But the prince of the Persian kingdom, this is a spiritual power of evil, okay? So this is evil forces over Persia resisted me 21 days that's a long time to be in traffic right you're on your way down to daniel but for 21 days you're in this traffic jam and believe me it's more than a traffic jam it's war it's war in the heavenlies because the enemy does not want daniel to hear from heaven doesn't want want that so he's attacking him there's a counterattack. all right so then michael right one of the chief princes he's one of the archangels of god big angel came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So we have the angel who's been delivering, who's coming with a message from heaven. He's hitting a lot of warfare and a lot of opposition. So for the angel to get through, he's got a, he's got Michael and angels helping him through, making him come to Daniel and he finally gets to Daniel and while he was saying this to me verse 15 I bowed with my face toward the ground and was speechless and then one who looked like a man touched my lips and I opened my mouth and began to speak I said to the one standing before me I am overcome with anguish because of the vision my lord and I feel very weak how can I your servant talk with you my lord my strength is gone and I can hardly breathe. This is Daniel speaking to the angel. Verse 18, again, the one who looks like a man touched me and gave me strength. Do not be afraid, you who are highly esteemed. He said, peace, be strong now, be strong. When he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, speak, my Lord, since you've given me strength. So, the angel comes to Daniel with a message, but also with comfort. Just like, remember if, when Jesus was in the wilderness and the angels came and ministered to him? That's what angels do. Angels come and minister. Angels come and bring strength. This is what an angel does. Now, how often do you think of angels? How often do you, are you aware that when you go out in the morning that there is an angel and part of the angel's job is to oversee you? <laughs> right? Anyone thinking of that Amy Grant song right now? Angels watching over me. This is this is the idea, right? Yeah, it fills with me. Any any seventies reference fills with me, right? So angels deliver this message under great great obstacles, um, and so and then give a lot of comfort in the process. So this is like this is amazing. This is this is like. You know, the Postal Service, they say it's through rain, sleet, and snow, right, Bob, right? But um, this, is, this is through a whole lot more than that. So that's the second thing about these messages. They come from angels. Number three, these messages are for kingdom ambassadors, kingdom ambassadors. 
It says to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now, the word church, we just use the word church all the time. Welcome to church. I'm going to church, all of that. But what is church? Church is, in the Greek, ekklesia, which means an assembly. An assembly. Any Avengers fans? So, right? Avengers assemble. What does that mean? That means, hey, we've got some business to take care of, right? We've got business to take care of. It, it, is, king, it is universal, galactic in its impact. Avengers assemble. That's what the king is saying to his church. Kingdom ambassadors assemble. We have kingdom business to take care of. That's you and me. We are an outpost right here in San Francisco of the kingdom of God because we follow Jesus, because he's our king, because we are loyal to him. And so as kingdom ambassadors, this message is for kingdom business here in San Francisco. You thought that the affairs of this city happen at City Hall. Wrong. The affairs of this city happen right here and in every sanctuary where the people of God meet and hear the words of, from heaven. That's where the city business takes place. You are kingdom representatives in this city. That's how Jesus is talking to his church. And when you look in the mirror, is that what you see? Kingdom ambassador, here to do the king's business. That's, that's the, the purpose of these messages, okay? So there's an urgency, there's a commissioning, like the king is going to say, here's, here's my work. Be part of my work. Be part of what I'm doing here in San Francisco. Because we believe he's at work everywhere, right? We believe that the king is at work all over the city. So we want to be part of that. Number four, this message, these messages are Jesus's self-revelation and assessment. Jesus is walking among the churches and he is revealing himself to his church and he's also giving us a state of the union. Like here is the state of the church. You know, a lot of us might have our own opinions about the church. We might think this about the church. There's a lot of people in society who are suspicious of the church, who, who don't trust the church for this reason or that reason. And many, many rightful reasons. There's a lot of legitimate criticism. But you know whose opinion matters most? His. His. Whatever he has to say about his church is what matters more than anybody else. Anybody on Twitter, anyone on social media, whatever they say about the church, fine. But what does he have to say? That's what we get from these messages. That's what we need. We need that more than anything else. So with that, we get encouragements, we get rebukes, we get corrections, we get exhortations, we get way to go, keep going, and knock it off, right? All of that from Jesus in all of these messages. So with that, let's dive into this one, okay? You ready? This is what we're going to see, this pattern all throughout these messages. Let's look at the, the message to Ephesus. Ephesus, again, big cosmopolitan city, very multicultural, big trade stop in the empire, the Roman Empire at the time. Paul was there. He was there for about three and a half years. So he really put some roots down and invested in this people, this church, and in, in, in this became a missional place. A lot of ministry happened out of Ephesus. And it probably was John, John probably was the pastor of the Ephesian church after Paul and after Timothy. So John has a lot of history here in um, Ephesus as well. So what do we see? What do we see? We see Jesus self-revelation. Again, this is Jesus saying who he is. And what we'll see is every time Jesus reveals something of himself, it is completely appropriate to the situation the church finds itself in. And so what is Jesus revealing about himself? He says this, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Do you remember what all that meant? You don't have to look far. Look a little bit above that in verse 20 of chapter one. 
He explains the stars, he explains the golden lampstands. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels. There's the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the angels and the churches are in the hands of Jesus. He wants the church at Ephesus to know that. He wants them to know I'm not just watching you from a distance. I am actually in your midst. I am with you. I know you. Okay, I know everything that's happening with you. And my angel is right there with you, ready to move, ready to support you. All of that is what this church needs to know. Is that something we need to know? Isn't it? He's in our midst. He's not far removed. He's not out there in the stars. He's not the force from Star Wars. He is with us here. And he knows you. He knows your situation, everything about you. That's what he wants this church to know. We'll see why that's important in a bit. Then Jesus gives his assessment. And his assessment is kind of a mixed bag with Ephesus. With Ephesus, there are some good things, and there are some not so good things, some bad things. First of all, the good. Verse 2, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance, right? So they're hardworking, they're serving, they're active in ministries, a lot of programs. He goes on, I know you cannot tolerate wicked people. You cannot, oh, you're intolerant of wicked people. That's not very San Franciscan, right? Intolerant that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. The Apostle Paul told them, if you want to look this up, Acts 20, 28 to 21, look out for wolves in sheep's clothing, those who will give you false teaching. Be on guard for that. Paul told those Ephesian elders that when he was with them, and it looks like they took that to heart. They were still doing it, and they persevered. And then in verse 6, it gives a little more specifics on who these false teachers are. And it's, it says this, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, who are they? We'll read more about them when we get to Pergamum. But the Nicolaitans, they were a people who kind of allowed for some cultural compromise. Right? So in Ephesus, you have the temple worship of Artemis and Diana. That temple was huge huge and it was beautiful and a lot of marble but a lot of immorality too and so the Nicolaitans probably were people who said look you followers of Jesus you can follow Jesus but go ahead and follow Artemis do what go to that temple too go to this temple go to that temple it's all fine that's what they did they were just compromising a lot and Jesus says you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans me too me too. I hate them too. All right, so that's good, right? They're active in ministry. They're persevering. They are really testing true and false teachings, and they're being discerning, all of that. And that's fine. That's good. Now here's the bad news. Verse 4. All of that, having said all of that, here's what Jesus says. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Isn't that remarkable? You could hate false teaching. You could serve a lot of people. You could be active in ministry. All of that may be good. But if you don't have your first love, that's no good. That's no good. Isn't that interesting how those two things can exist? Isn't it? You can be active in ministry. You could look the part as a Christian. You could do all the right Christian things, all the practices, read your Bible, pray, go to church, all those things. You can do all of those things, but if you don't have your first love in Jesus, it's all moot. It's all zero. It doesn't amount to anything. That's what Jesus is saying to his church, to his church. Sit with that for a minute, would you? Just sit with that. What drove you to church today? Was it just trying to, you know, check off your checklist and just say, okay, I did church today. 
I'm good. Or, you know, I need a little time in the Word today. Or I need to be around people. Or I need to serve. I need to do this or that. Checklist, checklist, checklist. Or did what drove you here today a deep love for Jesus, a deep love for the Lord? Now, I remember when I was a kid, I didn't come to church out of a deep love for the Lord. I came to church because I had to come to church. That was the way I came. But the way I came and how I came made me understand and know Jesus. And here's, here's what happens. What happens is you realize that this love for Jesus comes when you know how loved you are by Jesus, right? It was John who said, we love him because what? He first loved us, right? It's not our love that makes anything happen. It's his love that made everything happen. Him loving me is what produced this love for him. So if you're trying to say, oh, I got to muster up this love. I got to get my first love going. I need a little fuel in the tank. What am I going to do to be more loving? No. What do you need? You need to know Jesus. You need to know his love for you. And when you know his love for you, then all of a sudden, there's this love for him that comes out of you. And we become just so much about him and what he loves okay so is it possible then to hold on to truth and be discerning about good and bad and not do it out of love yeah it's possible it's possible but if that's the case what do we need to do we need to be with jesus we need to know him we need to say lord show me your heart and then when we do, he'll reveal his heart. He'll reveal his deep, deep love for us. And that will change our heart to love him first. Make sense? You good? Okay. So how are we to respond? How do we cultivate that love? It says in verse 5, Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And if you do not repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Wow. What does that mean? So again, the church, the lampstand of Ephesus, that's the church at Ephesus, the lampstand. And we can go through all of the scriptures in, in Zechariah 4, talks about a vision of a gold lampstand with seven lamps on it. And, and then the Spirit of God is what gives that light, that fire for the churches. That's what it represents, the fire of Jesus, the fire of the presence of the spirit in the church. So he's saying, look, you, I called you to be my light. A lamp gives light, right? You are a lamp. Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine, right? Right? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. That's what the light is supposed to do. Jesus said, you are a city on a hill. You're to be visible. You are the light of the world, right? The call that God has on our life is to be his light as a lamp. And God had a call on the people of Israel to be a light to the Gentiles. Well, they said, no, I don't want to do that anymore. And so what did God do? God took that lamp from Israel and then said, new plan, church of Jesus Christ, you are now my new lamp. Go and be a light in the world. That's us. We're to be a light. So we got to let it shine. That's what, that's what we have to do. <sighs> but what if we don't? What if we end up like Israel saying, I don't want, I don't want to be your light. I want to shine my own light <laughs> or whatever. I want to be me. Just let me be me. I want to do me. Ah, what, what's going to happen? Jesus is going to say, okay, just like Israel, I'll take the lamp from you. I'll give it to somebody who will be my light in the world, All right? So what do we do? And there are three steps here, three steps that, that Jesus gives to his church. We'll see it right here. First of all, he says, repent, All right? Repent means what? Change. Turn around. Turn around from the course you're going in and turn to him. Turn. Do a 180. 
What does that mean? Like when you start realizing that your love is not there for Jesus, it does mean you're loving something else, right? You're loving the world. You're loving acceptance. You're loving your friends. You're loving material stuff. You're loving money, whatever it is. You're loving something else. So turn from that and turn to Jesus. When you turn to Jesus, you're repenting. You're turning around. You're turning around. When I turn to Jesus, that's when I get to know Jesus. And as I get to know Jesus, I'll know his love for me. And now he'll move me in the right direction. But it starts with repentance. That move of repentance is always led by Jesus in kindness, right? It's his kindness that leads us to repentance, right? Romans chapter 2. So as we look at Jesus, we start looking at him. He's not going to look back at us with, oh, you brat. <laughs> oh, how many times? Or, oh, here we are again. That's not what you're going to see from Jesus. What are you going to see from Jesus? Kindness. The moment you start looking away from whatever it is you're loving and you start looking to him, you might think, oh, I can't look back. I can't look in his eyes. I've, I've forsaken my first love. I can't, I can't even look at him right now. But if you do look at him, what you will see is not condemnation or judgment. What you will see is kindness. He understands. Remember, he's the Lord who walks amongst the midst of the churches. So it's not like it's a revelation to him that, oh, my goodness, I can't believe you lost your first love. That's not Jesus. He knows you've lost your first love. He knows that. He's just ready to have you back. That's kindness. So repentance, it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Now, the second part is we remember. Remember where you were. Remember, remember the things you did at first. Now, this is a great analogy. The great analogy is marriage or a relationship, right? If you have a couple, if there's a couple who comes to me and they're starting to kind of fall apart, they're starting to separate from each other and they're realizing they're not connected, they can be way down that road or maybe it's just early goings. What I usually say is, do you remember when you loved your spouse? You remember those days? You remember when your, your spouse would walk through the door and your heart would go a flutter, right? Or do you remember when you used to really tune into your spouse and you just wanted to do anything, anything you could to meet your spouse's needs? Or you just loved getting to know your spouse. You wanted to know what, what her desires were, what was important to her. You remember that? do that <laughs> right that's what you do when when you've got two people who are estranged you just have them say you remember when you loved each other what'd you do what'd you do when you loved each other and you go back to those and that's that's one of the things when you've got a couple that is far apart from each other they just forget wait a minute there's a love there it's deep down and it's hard to surface but it's there you just got to bring it back how do you bring it back go back and do the things you did before Go back and do the things you did before. Now, this is not to say, I want to try to get my feelings and my romance and, you know, I want to feel all the feels. I, it's not about that. Jesus is not saying, get your first love and, you know, feel all romantic about me. That's not what Jesus is saying. Like if, and it's the same thing with Trish. If, if Trish, you know, if Trisha walks through the door and I tell her, you know, my, my heart's a flutter again. <laughs> you know what she's going to say? She's going to say, you should get that checked, right? <laughs> you know, get, get, you need to see your doctor. Something's going on in your heart, right? That would be a little weird for her because why? It's, our love is not based on our feelings. Our love, our first love is based on our commitment to each other, our desire and our want to know each other to be with each other, to enjoy each other, right? So it's going way beyond the fields. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I want you to know me, pursue me, come after me. When you come after me, you know what you'll get? Rest, love, my presence, my power, my joy. Come after me. 
Come after me. Do the things you did before. So if you, if you just kind of think right now, you know, have I lost my first love? You know, maybe, you know, prayer is not that, oh, I just want to be with the one who loves me so much. But now prayer is just like going through this list of prayer requests. You just got to get through them and then, you know, move on. It's not, if prayer is that way, then you just go back to, wait, this isn't about a checklist. It's about a person that I want to know and who wants to know me and wants to be with me, right? That's what we go back to. Anytime you divorce your Christian practices from the person, you're falling into just formality and rules and legalism and all of that. But whenever you just let the person fuel your desire to read the Bible and get to know Jesus, not just know a bunch of rules, and to pray because you can, you can be with the king of the universe who loves you and wants to show you his heart. And then you start talking about him with other people who don't know him because you love him and you want them to know his love too. That's where it all drives from. A desire to know Jesus will fuel everything else that you do as a Christian. That's why this is so important to the Lord. If, if our love for the Lord is not fueling what we do, then go back to when it did. Go back to that. You've detached the person from the practice. Go after the person and then go and go do the practices again, right? And then repeat. Do it again. That's what he says. Repent, do the things you did at first. And if you don't repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand. So do it again and again and again. Repeat. Do this again. Do what you did before, right? And when you do this again and again and again, things will change in your heart. You'll start loving the things that Jesus loves. You'll start seeing people the way Jesus does as well. I remember being on a panel with young adults and the topic was relationships. And there was one person who asked a question towards me because I think I was maybe one of the few people who was married. And he asked this question, which is a good question. He said, when you get married, does that resolve any temptation to lust? Which is a good question, because when I was single, I thought, oh, man, right? Paul said, you know, it's better to marry than to burn with passion, right? Because, you know, so hopefully you get married, it'll take care of all that lust problem. And short answer, no. <laughs> no, it doesn't take care of the lust. But here's what, I, here's what came to my mind and that I shared with this young man. I said, here's the thing now. When I see, if I see Trish walking through the door, what I start to realize is there's the one that I love, and there's, I love everything about her. So what I've found is that if I see a, an attractive woman walking down the street, coming this way towards me, here's what I've noticed, that the people that I find attractive tend to be white, and or fair-skinned brunettes with hair up to about here you see what i'm saying because i've attached my love to jesus now everything that trish is about is what i start to love even other people i find attractive i now find people who look like her attractive to me see what happens when you attach your love to a person, when you attach your love to Jesus, you start loving the things that he loves. You start loving what he looks like. And you start saying, I want more of that love in me. I love the way that Jesus is gentle with people. So I want to be gentle like that. I love how Jesus loves the poor. So I want to love the poor that way, right? So the more you get your first love, and you repeat, repeat, repeat. I want to get to know you. I want to be with you. The more you do that, the more it changes the way you love. It changes what you desire. It changes your interests. It changes your priorities because now it's looking more like his, right? And that's the whole point. You get your first love right, then everything else flows from that. Your practices, your other desires, your priorities, right? 
So that's why this is so, so important. And then verse 7, here's the promise. If you do these things, if you repent, remember, and repeat, and go after Jesus, here's what happens. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who's victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The promise is that if you do this, if you keep me as your first love, then you will be victorious. You will get my strength to overcome. And when you do, you'll find yourself in, an, in a future and an eternity that is filled with life. That's so good. That's so good. That's the promise, right? So for ourselves, where are your affections? Where is your love? What are you seeking more than anything else? What is the priority of your life? What's most important to you? Whose opinion about you matters more than anybody else's? Right? When you place Jesus as your first love, then what he says about you is all that matters. I've, I've shared this with you before, the, the whole name dropping thing. Like if somebody comes to you and says, you know who I saw at the cafe today? I saw Barry Bonds at the cafe today. And whoa, it was so great. I think I rubbed shoulders with him, even. I think I was in contact with him. And you can hear that, and you can be like, oh, that's cool. But in your own mind, or you might say this, you might say, you know who I was with this morning? The king of the universe. And not only did we spend some time together, he spoke to me. He said he loved me. He said I'm so valuable to him. He said he was grateful for me. He said I have a wonderful plan for your life. And he wants to do my entire day with me. But not to brag or anything. You know, I'm just saying, right? That's the experience that we can have with Jesus if he's our first love, when we remember that it's about the person and not the practice, and that the practices flow out of the person, right? That's where it starts, our first love. So as we come to the table of the Lord now, we are coming to the one who loves us first, I want to encourage all of us who, fall, who follow Jesus, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, do not, please, for the love of God, do not come to this table just as a practice. Come to this table to meet with a person. Come to this table to meet with the one who loves you, who laid down his life for you who values and treasures you so much so that he would come down and die the death that you and I deserved so that we could be freed to love him and make him our first love. So would you just meet with him and then let him reorder your love, reorder what you love most, who is most central in your life, would you let him be front and center as the king of your heart? And let him speak to you. Let him speak to you in these moments. Let's go after him. Let's go after him. He's here. He's in our midst. He's the one who walks among the golden lampstands. That means he's right here, ready, ready to meet with us. So let's spend these moments right now just with the Lord. In prayer, I invite you to just close your eyes, bow your head, be with him, shut everything else out. Be with him, the lover of your soul. Be with him. Let him love you right now.